Does anyone know what we're a part of? Is it really called the University of Tennessee Health Science Center College of Medicine, Chattanooga? That seems really long. Is that? At Chattanooga? Okay, we need another word in there. UTCOM. Okay. Awesome. The flexible male. I have no disclosures yet. Okay. Um, so for thousands of years, uh, pediatric fractures were treated non-operatively. But uh, over the past 40 to 50 years, surgeons and families have, have more of a desire for closer to anatomic alignment, shorter hospitalizations, quicker return to recovery, and improved pain control. So most pediatric lawn bone fractures were treated non-op until really about 50 years ago. And over in France, uh, two French surgeons at the Nancy University Hospital started flexible intramedullary nailing. And um, then the first guy in the United States that really kind of started making this popular was Dean McEwen, who is one of the fathers of pediatric orthopedics at DuPont in um, Delaware. A lot of the pictures that you see in my presentation today are going to be from um, this Nancy University manual book. Okay, so prior to what we use today for flexible intramedullary nailing, there were very similar devices that were used. Um, this is a rush rod. I don't know if you guys have used this in your residency. This is called an Ender's Nail. It actually has an eyelet at one end that you can interlock with. Um, and then this is the hackathon technique where what you would do is kind of get a bouquet of K wires and kind of fill the intramedullary canal with a bunch of K wires. Um, and we'll go into why this had a little, little bit of a higher failure rate than uh, other techniques. Okay, so if you are going to search for any articles on this. There's a number of different things uh, that people call these. So elastic stable intramedullary nailing is very popular. Titanium elastic nail system. Nancy nailing. I had heard, I didn't hear this till fellowship, but in fellowship they called it Nancy nailing and I didn't even know about Nancy France until I studied up for this talk. And then the the Metazow technique you've probably heard of for um, have any, has anyone heard of that guy before? For what particular fracture? Anybody? Radial neck. Radial neck that's correct. And then uh, more and more people are just using the term flexible intramedullary nailing. Okay, so there are a number of different properties to the flexible nail that you should be aware of. And each company that makes a system for flexible nailing has a little bit different properties to it. So some don't have any bend at the end, and they can they either be sharp or blunt tipped. So for instance, this one here doesn't have much of an initial bend on it, and um, as compared to, say, this center one here, which has um, a quite, quite a bit of an initial bend um, and a kind of a scalloped uh, edge to it as well. So, you know, you're going to have, for different applications, you're going to want to maybe have different types of flexible nails available to you. Also, some systems make titanium flexible nails. Some of them make stainless steel. You know, for instance, something like this, this is going to make the curve really easily to go from your entry hole and get into the depth of the, to the medullary canal nicely. But then if you have a tight medullary canal you're trying to fit down, this is likely to get stuck. Okay, so what is it that, why do we use flex nails in kids and not so much in adults? And why have we had such good success using them in pediatric fractures? Well, um, pediatric bone is different than adult bone in a number of ways. If you kind of think of it like, um, like kind of like green wood versus more of a dried out, more mature wood, it's kind of like it's lower mineral content, it's not as strong, there's higher water content, and so it tends to be more plastic. And so 
it, I mean, more elastic too. So what happens is you'll get some bending in the bone where a lot of times in an adult fracture, it'll snap in a sense. So thicker periosteum, better vascularity. And we harness those, uh, what happens with pediatric bone with a thicker periosteum and better vascularity to um, help when we do flexible instrument and nailing. So around this time, flexible instrument and nailing techniques in France, and then you had the AO principles kind of coming out just prior to this and around the same time. And I know that now AO principles have changed, but the original ones were very much focused on, you know, they, you get an anatomic reduction, you get very stable internal fixation, and then you get early mobilization. And so they try to really um, rely on primary bone healing versus secondary bone healing with flexible nailing. Flexible nailing, you're not going to have an absolutely rigid construct. But as it turns out, you don't need an absolutely rigid construct to heal a fracture, obviously. And we use that in peds for correcting deformities, not only just in fractures. So like there's a Russian doctor, his name is Dr. Elizarov, and what he did is he used external fixators and he would do osteotomies and he would lengthen legs and he would slowly correct angular deformities by using this kind of principle that movement of up to one millimeter will promote callus formation. So if you make an osteotomy and then you distract it a millimeter a day, the callus is going to be encouraged to form. So it showed that when you have motion that's either in compression or in distraction, that you're going to have a huge amount of callus being laid down. Not so much with shear and not so much with torsion. So when you're making these constructs with your flex nails, you want to make sure that you try to get, in, you try to get your torsional stability and shear stability, but, so mu but not so much flexion, I mean, uh, distraction or compression. We'll go into that a little bit later. Okay, so if you can at all, you want to try and leave the fracture hematoma there, leave the periosteum in place, because that's what's going to heal your fracture really quickly and get your patient back to normal activities really quick. So if you can, a lot of times we'll uh, attempt close reduction of these fractures and passage of the nails. Also, um, oh, I just talked about compression, extraction, and torsion. And then stability in the role of soft tissues for preventing varus valgus and those type of deformities. Okay, so I think I'll kind of, we'll go through this quickly and I'll show you in different bones how this works. But it's really important that you guys don't just bend the nail enough to get it in the intramedullary canal. So you're like, oh sweet, I made it in the intramedullary canal, let's just slide it up there. That's not classic flex nailing technique. You need to contour the rod significantly. Also, ideally what you'll do is bend both of the nails so they have identical curves, and then the position of the apex of the curve is at the fracture site. We talked a little bit earlier about this, but stainless steel or titanium are the two materials that you will probably have at your disposal when you're trying to decide what to use. I am no engineer or physicist, and so these are the kind of the main points from this, though. The modulus of elasticity of stainless steel is almost double that of titanium. So like we use this in scoliosis surgery, too, using cobalt chrome versus titanium. There's different material properties that you can use depending on what your application is. What's nice is titanium has a modulus much more similar to cortical bone. However, you're putting a small nail on the inner, inner intermedullary canal, so it's really not as stable as cortical bone in this application, but it's something to keep in mind. The force necessary to produce elastic deformation is less elastic for stainless steel than titanium. And then the bending stiffness is much higher in stainless steel than uh, titanium. So if you look over here on the right, bending stiffness, let's say, all right, we're going to try and fit three millimeter nails into our femur. And you, here's the bending stiffness, 4, 437 newtons per millimeter squared versus 795. So really it's almost twice the bending stiffness of titanium. So. 
we'll keep that in mind too because depending on what your fracture looks like, depending on how big your patient is, depending how old they are, um, depending on what size their canal is, you can decide on what material you want to use. Um, okay, if you guys remember this too, bending stiffness is radius to the fourth power for a solid nail, which is a flex nail. Also remember if you're using a hollow nail, like a rigid nail, but it's uh, slotted because you have a uh, guide wire that you're putting the nail over, you need to subtract out the inner hollow diameter. I know you guys just did OITE, so this is a little bit late. But, um, and also just remember if you're adding a second nail, it's, it really is additive. So you just double it. It's not to the fourth power. So two 3.5 nails are not as stiff as one seven. Does that make sense? Okay, so we'll talk about how to use these, whether to use, are you using them for mid-shaft fractures, are you using them for metaphyseal fractures, are you using them for epiphyseal fractures, depends on what application you're using for, on how you're going to contour your nail, and then how you're going to um, insert them. So ideally, you'll have two nails, the concavities should face each other, so you're rotating them against each other. The apex of the curve is located at the fracture site. And then this is just, and you think about this when you're K-wiring things, but this also is very important when you're flex nailing things. You don't want the nails to cross each other at the fracture site. If you're pinning a supracondylar with me, I really harp on this. You want the pins separated at the fracture site. You want them divergent. So you don't want them converging on themselves and crossing each other at the fracture site because that gives you the least amount of stability possible. So the same thing kind of happens with flex nailing. You insert, let's say it's the femur, you're inserting one nail from each side, they cross each other initially, then they go up the canal, they're maximally separated at the diaphysis fracture site, and then they come back and they cross each other away from the fracture site, and then they go to either side of the neck. So that's a good construct for that. Um, the way that they talk about it is there's bipolar constructs and there's unipolar constructs. Um, that just means you don't have to insert them the same direction. You can insert one from the top, one from the bottom. Uh, I do that routinely like for both bone forearm fractures where you're going to insert distally at the radius and you're gonna insert proximally at the ulna. Um, I'll show you some other cases of this in different bones. Um, okay. The other principle is the more distant the fracture is from the entry holes, the easier it is to achieve this perfect construct. If you are trying to enter just next to a metaphyseal distal femur fracture and you're making your two distal insertion sites, you are going to be, the nails are going to cross each other at the fracture site and you're going to have very little stability of the fracture. In the metaphysis, this is just like K-wire, the same thing. So divergent directions of the nails in the epiphyseal metaphyseal region, and um, the extent of diaphyseal support will provide in increased stability of the nails. I think we talked about that. Okay, so selecting a size. So in general, what you want to do is measure preoperatively your medullary canal, or you can do it intraoperatively too. And then what you do is you take that number and you multiply it by 0.4, and then you use your two nails. So you'll have, in a sense, 80% or uh, diameter canal fill. In the humerus, they say you can use smaller because it's not a weight as weight bearing of a bone. So for what it's worth, they recommend a third instead of a 40%. In my hands. If you're in doubt and you're in between two sizes, I tend to upsize because of the bending stiffness properties that we talked about here and the stability of your construct. So obviously you don't want nails to get stuck and you don't want to put a construct in there that doesn't look correct and function like it's supposed to. But on the other hand, if you're in between sizes, I'd go up a size. Okay. They talk about when you're when you're curving or when you're um, when you're taking when your your radius of curvature of your flex nails needs to be 50 to 60 times greater than the diameter of the nail. This is from some biomechanical study. What I want you guys to take from this is that usually means bend the nail about 40 degrees. So that kind of works out. 
So if, as, you, as you're contouring the nail, if you get about 40 degrees of bend, that will reach what they think is the most stable construct for your, for your flex nails. Apex of the curve at the fracture site. This means that, you know, they, there are some companies that have these pre-bent nails, but that doesn't really make any sense to me because each fracture is going to be a little bit more distal, a little bit more proximal than the other, and you may want to, as a surgeon, you need to contour these nails yourself. This is what radius of curvature is. So a smaller radius of curvature is going to be a sharper bend. And here's the 40 degree kind of rule that they talk about. All right, so you got to kind of, there's a number of factors when you're contouring these nails to think about. One is you want it to easily go in the entry hole, and then you don't want it just to plow out the opposite cortex. You don't want it to get stuck and plow out the other opposite cortex. You have to make that turn, and you need a nail that's going to make it into the medullary canal. You need a nail that is blunt enough that it's not going to just jam out the other side of the cortex, but, bl but sharp enough that it's going to go through dense cancellous bone, which is present in most pediatric fractures. And then you want your contour centered at the fracture site. So this has happened to me before where, you know, it's more of a proximal fracture. I center my curve at the fracture site, and I over contour, in a sense, the flex nail. So now the problem here is that now it's, it's stuck, but you're not even close. You're stuck on this cortex, and you're stuck on this cortex here because you overbent the nail here. Because you have this initial curve, and then you have your gentle curve for the fracture site. So you kind of have to get used to how to contour these things because you really want it to look more like this, not like this, and not like this. Okay, when you, when you choose your, your entry site for the, wherever you're going to put in your flex nail, Always remember that the flex nail is going to be going into the bone at an oblique angle. So you don't need to make a ginormous incision that extends proximally and distally to this hole. Usually what I do is I find out where I want to start with my nail and then I will go away from the fracture, if that makes sense. So usually towards the joint and not towards the fracture, away from it. Because you're going to start with your hole and then you're going to come this way with your entry hole and then your nail like this as well. Also when you come back to take the nail out, you're, you're pulling the nail out away from the entry hole side if that makes any sense. So your beginning of your incision is basically where that hole starts. Um, you can use a drill bit or an awl. I usually use a drill bit. In general what I'll do is I'll insert both nails to the fracture site, then reduce the fracture and then send one nail at a time not all the, I don't send one nail all the way to the very end and then try to send the second nail all the way to the very end. I think some, some surgeons uh, prefer that technique. For me, I, I like to just get both ready, get a good reduction, and then send both nails across. Um, make, sure that, make sure that your nails are in appropriate rotation and position prior to cutting the nail. Also, before before you really make it to the very end of your construct, I kind of like to have my rotation set if possible. And the reason for that is it gives you more rotational stability if you're not just going back and forth and just scraping out cancellous bone with your flex nail at the end of your construct because you're just giving up rotational stability in that case. Um, also, make sure that you're not distracting the fracture site prior to cut of the nails like before before that, always make sure at the fracture site that your fracture is impacted. That A will, if it does heal and it's distracted, you've given yourself, your patient, a leg length discrepancy. The bone's going to overgrow anyway, and you're going to take what probably was going to be a small leg length discrepancy and maybe make it, make it a clinically significant one, A. And then B, the other thing that's nice about impacting the fracture is it makes your construct more stable. And then tamping the nail, this is also a little bit of an art tamping it so that the nail is buried enough to prevent soft tissue irritation, which is a huge complication of these devices, yet proud enough that you can take the nail out later. Entangling is a phenomenon where the nails rotate around one another. So if you're putting two 
nails in. You don't just want to keep twisting your T-handle and just wrap the nail up around there. What usually happens with this is you end up rotationally malunighting the fracture. So you'll take a, you know, you'll give them excessive antiversion or retroversion depending on for a femur or insert whatever bone you want for that. But entangling is in general not something that you want and it also can be really easy to happen in stainless steel nails. For some reason I feel like if you're using a stainless steel nail it's much more easy to get stuck in this entangling phenomenon. Um, okay, so we'll talk about specific complications in a second, but main thing, rotational malunion. Tibia fractures are kind of bad actors in a sense of you can't just throw in a couple of sweet flex nails and then high five on the way out and think your tibia is going to do awesome. Um, make, sure that, make sure that you are intentional about the rotation, about the contour of your nail, and the placement of them. Okay. We don't have any literature to say that you have to remove the flex nails. It just seems that most pediatric orthopedic surgeons recommend nail removal in most of the papers. And it's for a number of reasons, but the nails, if they need to come out several years down the road, are very, very difficult. Most of the time we're using titanium and titanium, the bone kind of on grows or ingrows into the little crevices in the titanium, and it just sticks to it. And so if you don't get the nails out within a year or slightly after that, it can be really, really hard to get these nails out. So if you need to get them out later on, it's really difficult. And then also, especially if you're put, putting them in like a five-year-old, and the nails just grow up and up and up the, up the leg. And so then you'll look at the, I had a patient, I should have put it in here, but I had a patient that six years later they come back to see me now with pain and prominence over where the flex nail entry site was and it's halfway up the thigh right at the adductor canal. So now when I'm going in there to take the nail out, A, I don't think I'm going to be able to get it out because it's probably incarcerated in there. And then B, now I'm dissecting around essential neurovascular structures to the leg. So... All right, everyone has a little bit of a different protocol. I'll show you, I'll just give you guys what I do. But according to the Nancy manual, tibias, nails come out at four months, femur at five months, and forearm at six months. They had a huge series of forearm fractures that they, that they flex nailed. And they said that they had been taking them out when they thought that the fracture was healed somewhere around three to four months. And they had a, a number of refractures. They then left the forearm nails in a full six months, and they said that that problem went away. So they recommend leaving the forearm flex nails in at least six months. Also, an important thing to do is when you take the flex nails out after the fracture is healed, there have been reports that patients, if released or do too much activity too soon, can have fractures at the entry points where you take the nail out where you left that hole in the cortical bone or metaphyseal bone you can fracture through there so I usually in general don't allow I allow, I allow patients to weight bear is tolerated afterward but I generally don't let them go back to football or other contact sports for about six weeks Oh, okay. No, Nancy University Hospital in France is uh, the hospital that pioneered the technique of flexible inch medullary nailing. So uh, they wrote a textbook in French on how to do flex nailing, and then they um, now a number of American peds orthopods just call it Nancy nailing. So that's the that's their textbooks called the Nancy Manual. Okay, so this came out of one of the textbooks. There's a number of things wrong with this picture. First, don't flex nail femoral neck fractures. Okay, just don't do it. So this patient had a femoral neck fracture that was flex nailed, and then during hardware removal, they got an unstable femoral distal shaft fracture that then was re-flex nailed 
healed quite short, and the patient now has a significant leg length discrepancy and some varus. So they left the nails in longer than a year, and they what they had mentioned in this particular part was make sure you get the nails out early. I think there are some other issues that they could have talked about in this as well, such as don't, don't flex nail femoral neck fractures. Okay. Fistule injury, this is also not well described, but I think important, I think maybe this is an article we could write up even, Dr. Moses, is that when you take the nails out, you can't just go jamming in there and grabbing on and destroying some bone around the, the site that the nail is um, at the end of it. We've seen a few physial arrests after it. So you have to be careful. You have to respect the physis during hardware removal. I think that's important. That's an important point to make. Ask me later about the slide technique. Okay. Um, right, Fraser, the slide technique. I think you, we took out a number of flex nails in your own rotation. Um, okay, applications in the lower extremity. Let's start with the femur. A um, couple of technical points. I usually just use a flat Jackson table. You can use a fracture table if you want to. Um, make sure you measure the diameter of the, diameter of the inch medullary nail preoperatively. It's nice if you can uh, choose both nails before you know, before, before you just go in there trialing because you usually need to choose two nails at once, contour both of them identically, and then send the flex nails in. Um, and I bend both of them about 40 degrees. I usually make two distal incisions here about two centimeters or so proximal to the distal femoral physis. I try not to be too proximal because then you're entering hard cortical bone which A, is at a risk for refracture if you take the nails out, and then B, is uh, just more technically difficult to get the nails in. I usually try to go right here at the metaphyseal um, bone area where the cortex is more thin. Um, oversized drill bit with soft tissue protector. I usually start perpendicular to the bone, and then I kind of move to an oblique drill trajectory because then that way when you insert your nail obliquely, you'll be able to make that curve and make it into the medullary canal. I usually will do this by hand. And once I'm able to get it into the intermedullary canal, then I'll switch to mallet. But I, I personally just have a, a little better time with that instead of just initially just malleting the thing and hitting the far cortex. When you're using it by hand, I like to use an oscillating motion with my wrist, so that way you kind of don't get the, the initial send of the flex nail stuck in that dense, like, cancellous bone in the metaphyseal region of the femur. I think when you're kind of wallering it out in a sense, that it will um, be less likely to get stuck there and make that turn a little bit easier. Okay. Once I get to the fracture site, we get it reduced. I then will send both nails a short distance into the femur. I won't just send them all, one all the way. And I think it, that's just my personal preference, and I think either way is totally fine. Whatever you find more comfortable for you is okay. Um, make sure that as you are sending it up into the proximal aspect of the femur, pay really close attention to your fracture reduction. Even though, yes, you want your lateral nail to curve up and then point lateral and your medial nail to curve up and point medial, that is ideal but not always what's best for the fracture if that makes any sense. If that makes sense. What you want to do is you want to be able to rotate the nail to correct um, like varus or valgus, apex posterior, apex anterior angulation or translation. And in certain fractures that tend to go into varus or valgus, like in the tibia, you may want to point both nails in one direction. Uh, so I usually do that before I set them all the way up at the proximal aspect of the femur. Impact the fracture site, cut nails at the skin, and then tamp them underneath the skin. I use, try to leave about a centimeter out of the cortex for future removal. Okay, so for proximal femur, a couple key points. One, center of your bend is going to be very proximal at your nail, and then um, have your entry point far away. Don't try to enter the femur proximally for a proximal fracture. And then same thing here. If you're, A, I don't really think 
in my hands, flex nails for a fysial fracture, the distal femur is really my forte, but they talk about doing it safely. But for that also, you're not going to enter the femur here for your flex nail. You're going to enter proximally and um, not distally. So you want your entry point to be far away from the fracture site. It is okay to drive them across the physis. Wow. Yeah, I uh, only do it if necessary, but it is okay to do that. Um, one pass. Yeah, one pass. Don't just, uh, several passes may not be in your best interest long term. Um, okay, so I always reserve the right to put them in a spica cast, and I tell the family that before I nail these. Uh, femurs. I tell them that you're, when you go see your, your kid in PACU, you may, they may be in a spica cast. And I warn them about that because um, every once in a while, if you get in there and you can't get as large of a nail as you want to, or if it's length unstable, or a little bit of comminution, or as you pass your flex nail across the fracture site, you blow out a cortex, or insert whatever happens in surgery. If, and and it, you can add a spica cast, and that'll help with your um, stability at the end. I usually keep the non-weight bearing until I see some substantial callus, which is usually four to six weeks, and then nail removal at nine months. Um, no contact sports for six weeks. And then I usually follow them for a minimum of two years. If this was like a really uncomplicated case, they healed up fine, I follow them for two years and they're doing great, then I quit following them. But um, any, obviously any complications or other issues, you need to follow them f uh, further out on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, I think instability is an issue that is um, hard to predict but not impossible to predict prior to surgery. Leg length inequality is something to talk about and varus and valgus malunion. Um, in children, in children less than 10 versus older than 10, leg length discrepancy is much more of an issue in the younger children. They tend to overgrow their fractures more, and on average, it's 9 millimeters. Um, in oblique fractures, you go ahead and impact the fracture, and you'll slightly shorten a few millimeters. That's just part of your flex nail technique, and that actually will overgrow, and then you'll end up with great leg lengths. Yeah, uh, right. If there's obliquity and the fracture can tolerate, I usually go five millimeters to a centimeter. Um, and then if it's a transverse fracture, those are the ones that you just need to make sure you get good cortical contact, and those are the ones that tend to overgrow about a centimeter. You can usually tolerate up to two centimeters of uh, leg length discrepancy and don't have any long-term horrible sequelae, so um, most of the time you're not ending up having to do epiphysiodeses in these patients, but occasionally, yes. Um, also, because these are not solid, rigid nails, you may end up having some varus or valgus. Especially in younger patients, you can expect two degrees of, of correction over three years. So don't immediately try and go back and correct varus or valgus unless it's really clinically significant. You can usually accept up to six to eight degrees without any issues. Okay, an instability. Remember that you shouldn't just flex nail every fracture. It's not uh, everything, every fracture can be flex nailed. I think some people in P the PEDS rule think that, but you gotta be aware that a really comminuted fracture or length unstable fracture is gonna be much harder to control with a flex nail. All right, where's Dr. Alvarez? Oh my word, I put this slide in here just for him. Okay, so uh, here's the cost of some pediatric femoral implants. So if you use two 3.5 titanium flex nails, this is just uh, rounded to the nearest uh, zero. It's about 650 bucks for the set. Uh, solid lateral entry femoral nail, 1,000 bucks for the nail and 150 bucks for each interlocking screw. A large frag plate is 450 bucks and 20 bucks for each non-locking screw that you use. Um, and then if you're using that fancy waterproof pantaloon that I love, 
that's about 120 bucks. That's true. I should have I should have found out exactly what the stainless steel is, but it is significantly significantly cheaper. Okay, a couple of before we move on to other fractures, this is just a couple of recent articles that I found interesting about uh, flex nailing in femurs. First is, um, can I know the typical indication is children aged six to eleven or five to eleven in some. Um, for flex nails, but realize that for certain applications, it may be good to flex nail femurs at a younger age. And I think high energy injuries um, or, or polytrauma or things like that, it is okay to flex nail even down to two year olds um, and it can work. I think that's basically what this, what this said. They looked at children aged two to six which can also, because when you spike of them, that's not an anatomic reduction, they can tolerate a lot of quote-unquote malunion, like 15 degrees of varus or valgus, 20 degrees of flexion and extension, and this will remodel in a young kid. Um, and they had a shorter time to ambulation, 29 days versus 51 days in the spica, shorter return of full activity, 74 days versus 87 days. And it was interesting in the discussion they talk about um, Parents take an average of three weeks off from work to care for patients in a spica cast. 70% of children are not safely restrained in vehicles with a spica cast, and many daycare facilities don't take spica casts, but will take wheelchair kids without casts. So it's something to consider in treatment of these fractures. Um, please don't take from this that every three-year-old is going to get flex nails, but um, also realize that in certain situations, uh, it may be an okay choice. Also, we talk about typical indications in femur fractures in kids who are heavy. There was a study from Morose in 2006 that reported five times greater failure in flexible instrumental nails in children greater than 49 kilograms. And I think that's where we kind of got that number from. You guys probably have all memorized that. In 2008, Wall reported higher failure rate in titanium than stainless steel nails in greater than 49 kilograms. There wasn't specifically 49 kilograms, but you could kind of extrapolate out some data. So this, um, this group used stainless steel instead of titanium, and they went ahead and flex nailed kids that were older than 10 that were more than 100 pounds. And on average, in this group, um, they had... 24 patients, and they actually were on average 120 pounds, and they actually didn't have any complication. Their complication rate, loss of fixation, loss of reduction, healing rates were no different from the kids who were light. So they concluded that you can use stainless steel in heavy patients without increased complications. They then used that same data set and published a second paper, um, which made me think, are they onto something? the same cohort of 261 patients. And um, they looked at the typical Nancy manual that says that you need to choose a nail diameter that's 0.4, the canal diameter. And in the stainless steel, they had patients that had a smaller flex nail and still achieved a good result using stainless steel nails. So they concluded that you can use a nail that's slightly smaller and still hold an acceptable reduction due to the sense that they have twice the bending stiffness and um, modulus of elasticity of titanium. A couple more things just to talk about quickly with you guys. Can you rigidly nail a skeletally immature child? And the answer is yes. We don't know how young you can do this, and we just don't have the data on this. This was kind of one of the first one of the first papers that came out looking at a troke entry nail, which back in the year 2000, um, most nails were inserted prior to this using a piriformis start. As you can see down here, they had a number of cases where they had avascular necrosis of the femoral head and pediatric patients that were rigidly nailed. So they said, don't rigidly nail pediatric patients. So then they, this group went ahead and nailed 10 to 17 year olds and to had no AVN from a troke entry. So they thought it was safer. 
uh, my mentor from fellowship, Dr. Peter Stevens, would use rigid nails to correct aniversion in patients down to age eight. And he also did, oh, he also did um, a big study back in the 80s looking at patients who had coxa vera and other proximal femur deformities and trying to use guided growth to affect some sort of change and make the proximal femur look good, look grow appropriately. He found that a greater trochanteric epiphysiodesis at age nine or greater had no effect on proximal femur growth. So then from that, they started nailing femurs from the troch start in eight and nine year olds and 10 year olds. And in their series, um, had no AVN. Of course, in this series here, seven is not a lot of patients to really draw safe conclusions from. But just to let you know that um, if you, depending on what company you use, there's even a, a nail company out there that makes a 5.5 rigid, rigid nail that you can interlock. But anyway, just a couple things to think about. Here's a six-year-old male. Real quick case, we'll keep moving. What time is it? Oh, my word. Let's just keep moving. Anyway, watch this. Troke entry nail, uh, flex nail, and a distal nail. One from each side. Fracture healed. Bada bing, bada boom. Next. Okay. Sorry, guys. I'm going so slowly here. Um, okay. Tibia shaft fractures. Who can be casted and who needs flex nails? That's, this is kind of a tough call. So um, obviously, we have some like you know open fractures, compartment syndrome, polytrauma, floating knees. But the tolerances, especially like if you think about an intact fibula with a fracture that's going into significant varus, that's going to be very difficult to be managed in the cast. Um, so five degrees of varus valgus should be tolerated, 10 degrees of procurvatum, recurvatum, and 10 millimeters of shortening. You have to talk with patients about this, that cast may mean more than three months of immobilization. Sometimes that's, that means it's not non-weight-bearing immobilization, but it still is immobilization of some sort for more than three months. Long leg cast in kids. Remember, you can put them in some plantar flexion. Pe Pete's patients are less likely to get an Aquinas contracture. Flex the knee at least 45 degrees for rotational control and prevention of weight-bearing. Gypsotomy is cast wedging. Um, so... This is just, it's a little bit painful where I see these patients back every week. You're taking them back. You're adjusting the wedge in the cast, and uh, it's, um, it's, it's painful, but good. Okay. Tafsil tiba, same thing. What, I, what usually happens here, we'll go a little bit quicker. This is, we went through most of the principles, so we don't have to repeat ourselves too much. I still bend both nails approximately 40 degrees to get a good curve. It needs to be smooth, no sharp curves in your nail. And then um, here's your starting point. Make sure that your starting point's not too anterior. I find it really easy to insert the nails too anterior in the tibia. On the lateral side, it's no big deal. On the medial side, it is a big deal because the nail ends up being really prominent and the patients don't like that. Um, okay. Let's keep moving here. Um, with, with tibia nails, you need to make sure that you don't send them too far out into the syndesmosis, into the ankle joint, things like that. So be very careful with your length of your nail. You want it to be in the metaphysis, and you want to have that rotational stability, but be very careful. I've seen ones that kind of migrate out of the uh, bone and cause problems. Distal tibia, you can use it, kind of same thing, proximal starting point. Proximal tibia, they talk about a, a distal starting point. Again, I think if you start just ahead above the syndesmosis, no big deal. This is great. This nail, on the other hand, not so great. This is, it's, you, they talk about starting it really posterior, like right by the nerve and artery, which makes me, A, a little bit nervous, uh, but then that's the only way to keep this nail from being extremely prominent. So you can do it. Um, you just got to be very careful about it. With tibias, this is, I think, an important point to talk about. You need, to, don't just put the nails in, have the concavities facing each other, and then leave the OR. You need to make sure that you have corrected the deformity, depending on oblique 
uh, fractures, especially whether the fibula is intact or not, you may need to do something different. So, for instance, if you put your nails in and you're still in valgus, a couple of things you can try. One is rotate the nail so that both of them are pointing towards the medial malleolus to put a varus force. And then you can also send a flex nail or a Steinman pin, rush rod, something like that, up the shaft of the fibula. That can help prevent a valgus mal malunion of your uh, tibia. <clears throat> I find that about two-thirds of my patients after flex nailing the tibia still get immobilization afterward in the form of initially a splint, um, possibly a cast, or a, a boot. So tibias are a little different. I think that they tend to go get uh, malunited and their tolerances are a little bit less, so you need to be careful with the tibia. Um, Leg length discrepancy, less of an issue with the tibia, and then also compartment syndrome, of course, we know about that. All right, both bone forearms. Um, stainless steel is an option here because um, the size of the flex nail that you can fit into the canal of the radius or the ulna is not very large sometimes. So if you really um, make sure you have stainless steel available, so that you can get adequate control of the fracture if titanium is not doing it for you. If you're using a large nail, what I do is I'll take the nail removal device and I'll clamp down on the uh, end, on the insertional end of the nail, and I'll flatten out that initial curve. That's really helpful in these fractures because you won't get the nail stuck in the intermediary canal and you can use a larger size. Also, there are companies out there that have, like I showed you at the beginning, they don't have an initial bend on the nail initially, and those are really nice to use for forearms too. They say to still put a smooth contour in the ulna nail. I haven't been doing that. Now that I've read about it, maybe I'll start trying it. They say that what you want to do is turn the ulna nail towards the radius. The radius should help restore the radial bow. The ulna should kind of push against it tension your interosseous membrane and that will give you more stable construct. I tend to just put a stable, I mean a, a straight nail down the ulna. Um, okay, when you're doing these both bone forearm fractures, I find it easier to nail the radius first. And then also don't just put the nail all the way up to the radial uh, neck. What I do is I, what you can do is send it just a little bit past the fracture so it's going to stay in the fracture and you're not losing your reduction. But then once you put the ulna nail in, if you're having trouble reducing the ulna, it just depends what the ulna looks like, but if you're having trouble reducing the ulna, you still leave the radius a little bit floppy so that you can get the ulna reduced and then pass your nail. Also, if you have the radius reduced closed and you need to open up the ulna, the ulna is really easily accessible, safe approach. And if you need to make a mini open to get the ulna reduced, uh, I don't think that's a big deal. Okay, radius, two entry points, dorsal, which is by uh, Lister's tubercle, has associated EPL rupture. And it depends on who you read, but they one study quoted 18% of patients, which is ridiculous. I don't, I'm not sure what happened with that study, but that's a little bit of an outlier. But still, EPL rupture is not something that you want to have happen from flex nailing. So in my, you can use it if you need to. And depending on the fracture, especially a distal fracture, you may want to go dorsally. So don't, don't just discount it and not use it. But I think in general, I would recommend a radial starting point. You just got to be careful of not having a radial, a superficial nerve palsy uh, injury. But otherwise, it's a good place to put your nail. Also, as opposed to the tibia or femur where you worry about entangling, I think sometimes rotating the nail with your T-handle 360 degrees will keep the nail moving down and um, making it through the inch medullary canal nicely, kind of like a drill bit that you have on hand. All right, we talked about that. Okay, there's a paper out there that says don't pass, don't try closed over and over and over to get your radius reduced closed and you're just like, all right, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. And you keep missing and jabbing the soft tissues. They say it increases your risk of compartment syndrome from soft tissue trauma. Um, okay. Ulna, 
you, a lot of people used to put it through the olecranon uh, process, but that has a really high rate of olecranon bursitis, and patients don't like it, especially if they try to put their elbow down on a table. It's prominent, a lot of skin issues with that. I like to go laterally. Dr. Klumper? Uh, yeah, the Nancy manual says yes, but I put a bigger nail in there. I oversize it, yes. Um, the, I, I go through the ankyneus, and just on the lateral side of the olecranon, I enter there. The ankyneus, there's lots of soft tissue there to cover. The nail is not prominent. It's a safe approach. I usually go in from that side instead of going in right the tip of the olecranon. Okay, nails removed at six months. You really don't have to mobilize these fractures after surgery either. It's a stable construct. I usually splint them for comfort and then switch to a removable brace until it's healed. That's probably overkill. Um, okay, flex nailing works in this study. This study talks about the 18% EPL rupture. Two with them, two out of, it was three out of 17 patients, so that's probably what happened with this study. But um, two within the first two weeks. They continue to still use a dorsal approach because they like it, but they say to be vigilant to watch out for these things. Okay, I want to get to, we're almost done. I'll just kind of show you some x-rays probably for these. Proximal humerus fractures, flex nailing works really nice for that. K-wire fixation for proximal humerus can be problematic because you have so much soft tissue between the K-wire and um, the skin that you tend to have a high rate of skin infection and um, unsightly scars. So this is an, uh, an alternative to that. Remember, it's okay to cross the physis. These are usually older patients that don't have a lot of growth remaining anyway. So you can get a pretty stable construct with flex nails. With, with the humerus, you put both nails in from the lateral side, two centimeters proximal to the lateral epicondyle. That way you miss the spiral groove and the radial groove for the radial nerve. That's a safe place to enter. I still dissect down bluntly, and I get retractors in there, and I make sure that for some reason I'm not too far anterior and I'm just blasting into the radial nerve or something like that. Um, okay. Anyway, th had it, they did this in 118 patients. Worked well. So here's a, here's a polytrauma patient, 8-year-old, hit by a car, auto versus pedestrian, um, humerus and tibia. Here was the tibia flex nailed, here's the humerus flex nailed, and uh, the humerus healed up. Uh, I usually just put them in a sling after, after this. You don't have to put them in any type of uh, brace or cast, uh, co-optation splint or anything like that. Okay, real controversial real quick, clavicle. We usually treat clavicle fractures non-operatively in adults and kids. Um, we try to, we, as peds orthopods are like, oh, don't worry about it, it'll remodel. Well, it doesn't always remodel. And the thing is, 80% is of the total clavicle growth is achieved by age 9 in girls and 12 in boys. So you're not going to get a ton of remodeling of this fracture um, in late adolescence. Downside of plates and screws, prominent hardware, refractor after plate removal and cosmesis. Indication in a widely displaced, shortened, non-comminuted, I think is the main point here. Mid-shaft clavicle fracture, I think, flex nail. There's more and more studies coming out uh, every year. This seems to be a bit of a hot topic. Um, what you do is you insert the nail medially, and then you don't even have to open the fracture site. In many cases, you just use little towel clamps to make a percutaneous reduction, send your flex nail across the fracture site, Sling for comfort, and I just let them range as tolerated to level the shoulder. I don't let them go overhead initially with the flex nail. Um, I just keep it just to the level of the shoulder. Once you get some healing, I let them start range of motion. A um, couple of studies showing that it works. Here's a patient that I flex nail. This is a mildly displaced clavicle and a 15-year-old. They actually came in asking for flex nailing of the clavicle, which I found very strange, but... Um, Anyway, she thankfully has healed it up great. Um, I think the main problem with the clavicle is 
we don't know if you can just leave these things in. And with other flex nails, we recommend removal, which is a second surgery, whereas if you plate the clavicle, you just leave them in for life. And so that A, you're signing them up for a second surgery. B, this medial part, you need to be careful of where you start and don't leave this too long because this can be really irritating to the patient. And if you're already planning to take it out, I guess it's not a big deal. But if you are thinking maybe we can use this like a plate and screws and just splint the bone and then it's not a big deal, you got to be really careful about that. Okay. I know I just talked about flex nails, but remember there's a lot of great ways to fix fractures. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Thank you very much. Yes, Dr. Doty. You, they do not. And the reason for that is the intramedullary canal of the clavicle tapers laterally. So even when you're flex nailing these things from medially, you're not going to snake the nail all the way around because the diameter of the, of the um, intramedullary canal laterally kind of gets tighter. Um, I, I guess you could just use a smaller start and then it kind of balloons out trumpet style towards the medial side. I have not seen it for using just a standard... FIN technique. I know that there's rigid inch medullary nails that they do for that, right? Is that what you're talking about? There's a number of studies coming out looking at adults just using flex nails for clavicles. Uh, interesting. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. Yes, Dr. Moses? Yep. Good point, point. Yes, Dr. Noah. Yeah, Smith and Nephew, yeah. Well, usually what I do is I'll get something underneath, and you can, first, if it's a smaller, you can just take like a um, neurosuction and you go over it and you can kind of bend the nail out to get it away from the bone. You can do that before you, before you, when you insert the nail, you can kind of bend the tip and have it come out a little bit. And then also in the flex nail sets, they have a removal vice grip that has a slot in the center of it. So when you clamp down on it, it's pretty secure. And then it has a little um, out cropping thing that you can hit with the, with the mallet. So it works pretty well. I mean, it's, I, there needs to be a better nail removal device because you still have to make a fairly good size incision to get this vice grip over it. But you don't have all the bony ingrowth through the, well, it depends where you put in the ender's nail. But yeah, very similar. Orthopediatrics has stainless steel flex nails, which end up being very similar to ender's nails. If you don't, if you don't want to use, they don't have an eyelet. So if you don't interlock them and you don't want to use that, you could just grab that set and use it. I mean, it's just appealing to cut the set once the nail's in, because then you don't have to do the whole... No, you don't. Yeah, that's what's really nice about it. You should have figured out nail length like you do with ender nails. No, you just get it close to where you want it, and then you cut it at the skin, just tamp it under the skin, and you're done. All right. Yeah. Yeah.
yeah, it's a size. And the thing is, if you add a second nail, it's just times two bending stiffness versus you upsize the radius of one nail and it's to the fourth. So putting, that's why I think that hackathon technique didn't work because they put a bunch of small K wires up there and the thing just bent around and broke. I think it's better to use one bigger nail in the, in the forearm just for that reason. Yes, Dr. Sabri. Uh, it's distal and lateral, two centimeters proximal to the lateral pacondyle. It's a nice place to enter. Um, it's two nails. And you can, I mean, it just depends on whether you think it's going to go into varus or not. But, you know, for this particular fracture, they're, they're um, rotated to prevent varus. But you can, just depends on your application of it. The S bend, yep. Thanks, guys.